Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Jess Lenore in Baltimore. Hundreds of demonstrators took to the streets of Chicago on Sunday, August 7th, to protest the fatal police shooting of a black man in the city last month, snarling traffic. Authorities on Friday, August 5th, released videos that captured the moments before and after police shot 18-year-old Paul O'Neill, but not the shooting itself, because the police officer's body camera was not recording. Paul O'Neill becomes just the latest killing that has fueled the ongoing debate on how to stop police violence. While our next guest argues what's received less attention is how the gutting of the Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable searches and seizures has helped lead to many police killings, such as the death of Eric Garner and Philando Castile. He says every moment that Fourth Amendment law remains unchanged risks people's lives. Well, we're now joined by Matthew Siegel. He's a legal director of the ACLU of Massachusetts. His piece in The Guardian is Beyond Black Lives Matters, Police Reform Must Be Bolstered by Legal Action. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So talk about what you mean, that every moment the Fourth Amendment law remains unchanged, people's, it, it risks people's lives. It's costing people's lives. Talk about that. Well, what we've seen in this country over the last few years is a recognition that police practices have not been adequate to the task of protecting civilians from violence, sometimes violence from police officers themselves. And what has been talked about less are the Supreme Court cases uh, behind the actions of police officers that paved the way for this violence. And what I was trying to focus on in the piece is the need for the case law to change in order to better protect people. There needs to be much more protection for civilians who are confronted by police officers. And although police departments can provide that protection, so can courts. And that is, it is a key issue because, um, you know, and this has been even sort of put on steroids with the war on drugs. Um, there's so many negative interactions where uh, people are stopped or searched or arrested with, um, with, you know, very little cause. And the courts, you know, as you, as you argue, they, they give the officers sort of an unreasonable benefit of the doubt. Um, I wanted to start off by, uh, by talking about um, Wren versus the United States. And you say that's you know, one, of the, one of the key um, pieces of, of law here, of case law here. It's, uh, it allows officers to use any violations like a broken taillight. Like that's what Philando Castile was stopped you know, dozens of times for as a, you know, as a pretext to stop people they deem suspicious. And is, is, that, is that reasonable? Well, I mean, that's really one of the it's, uh, key points about policing in America. Some of the actions that people are protesting against, that people think are outrageous when police officers do them, are actions that courts have actually held to be reasonable. It, the, the primary protection that the Constitution is supposed to provide people against unreasonable searches and seizures, unreasonable uses, and uses of force, is the Fourth Amendment. Which, which creates this reasonableness rule. So that's supposed to keep you from be, your body from being seized by the police unreasonably. It's supposed to keep the police from using violence against your body unreasonably. And what the courts have said time and again is they don't think much violates that, that rule, that reasonableness rule. And so when you have uh, a situation like uh, a black man being pulled over for a broken taillight, or uh, being grabbed for um, selling loose cigarettes. That, stri that police conduct strikes people as outrageous, and yet courts have said it's reasonable. And that's really what needs to change. We need courts to reassess what they are saying is reasonable because those assessments are really blueprints for uh, police departments. And sometimes when horrible things happen, when acts of violence happen, it is the police following the blueprints that courts have given to them. Now, um, you know, to, now, you know, supporters of this case law, and I'm sure many police departments, police unions would argue that officers need the benefit of the doubt. They, you know, they can't be second guessed. And, you know, um, if they need to, they, they, need, they need to protect themselves, right? They need to be able to use force and protect themselves. And, you know, be able to trust their 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 instincts or their judgment when they're when they're interacting with people. How do you respond to those type of arguments? 
Well, there's a difference between making those arguments now in the light of day, now that we've had decades of trying out this case law, and, and perhaps making them years ago. And what has happened is over time, since Wren was decided 20 years ago, uh, since some of these other cases were decided, we have seen in the streets of America how it's worked out. And the results are in, and they're terrible. Uh, Wren has, in effect, led to widespread racial profiling that's been docu do uh, documented across the country. Other cases about when police can use force are the reasons why uh, police uh, are sort of ha find themselves needlessly killing people rather than de-escalating uh, situations. And so what I'm not suggesting is that we need a case law that just throws caution to the wind and fails to protect police officers. What I am saying is that we need a case law that also protects civilians, and we just haven't had it yet. And so, um, you know, it's going to be tough to, to challenge that, right? Because um, police in our society have, they've essentially received immunity. They have to do a tough job, and they've received these protections because they are playing a function in our society. So how do we go about, um, talk about how we go about challenging this from the, the more, more immediate steps to sort of long term as well? Well, change is hard. And uh, it's a credit to uh, folks involved in the Black Lives Matter movement and in other movements across this country about uh, policing uh, that they have um, taken this issue, brought it to the national, uh, to the nation's attention, and they are really making progress. And yes, changing case law is hard too, but we have to do it. And it's something that lawyers, you know, who are, uh, and judges, honestly, who are sitting at home, reading the paper, watching the news, seeing these horrible things unfold, it's something that they can work on. Uh, uh, lawyers across the country can start to raise arguments that say, yes, public safety matters, but that doesn't mean safety only for the police. It also means safety for civilians. And you know, our office uh, here at the ACLU of Massachusetts, we submitted a brief in a case uh, not too long ago about uh, an, an innocent man who was shot and killed by a police officer. And the first thing we said in our brief was, this is a case about public safety. I think courts hear all the time from police officers about the need to protect um, police from violence. And I'm not saying they should no longer hear from police on that but they need to hear from everyone else too. They need to understand uh, that everyone's life matters, and including black and brown people, including the people who are most often subjected to police violence. And so, um, you know, this, so this case law will have to be challenged at the Supreme Court level, I, I would imagine. Um, how significant um, is the, the death of Antonin Scalia? And how important could, you know, potentially three new Supreme Court justices that are appointed by the next president be if, if we want to challenge these decisions? Well, uh, no matter who is the Supreme Court uh, justice who uh, takes the place of Antonin Scalia or who, or who or other justices who, who come onto the Supreme Court, all of the justices need to, to hear about how their Fourth Amendment case law is working. And that is the job of lawyers and uh, civil rights organizations all across the country, public defenders to, to raise this issue, um, to say, look, this, these Fourth Amendment cases haven't worked. We need to go back to the drawing board. And so there's a role for lawyers to play. There's a role for the Supreme Court to play. There's also a role for, for government to play. There's a study that just came out by um, a professor at Harvard Law School named Andrew Crespo. And what he found is that the United States government uh, opposes criminal defendants about 96% of the time at the Supreme Court. And in light of what we're seeing in the streets of America right now, that does not make sense. All right, Matthew Siegel, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us at The Real News Network.